boys that ages ago for the boys in Manchester Trump. Everyone knows the story of Radio Caroline and the swinging 60s DJs whose rebellious buccaneering on the high seas led to the birth of Radio 1. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1. But there's another pirate radio story. A story you don't know. One that played out on the rooftops of inner city Britain in the Thatcher years. Doesn't matter who you are, if you can build up a fortune to yourself, jolly good luck to you. Because in doing so, you will help to create jobs for others. This is the story of how a whole musical culture was ignored by legal radio. And how people who were disregarded and dismissed had to break the law for their music and their voice to be heard. It was always an occupational hazard to be a young black person at that time. So for me to go and climb and put up a mask, we didn't know any better. We didn't know you didn't get nicked. It's a tale of a generation of black music entrepreneurs who embraced the spirit of the age, but were criminalised for doing so. For me, I had to make things work, not because of them, despite them, because they weren't giving me an opportunity. Of music lovers who play the game of cat and mouse to stay one step ahead of the authorities. Let's be honest, we liked chasing pirates. No one's ever seen me fight. I'd take some licks to try and save my albums, I'm telling you backed by a government determined to take them down. Pirates I have no time for, and I think we should crack down on them as hard as we can. Being part of that was the single most exciting thing that ever happened to me, ever. I'm Rodney P, and my journey as a hip-hop artist and the careers of countless other black British musicians and DJs would never have been possible without the platform of Pirate Radio. This is the untold story of how Britain's greatest generation of pirate radio broadcasters took on the establishment and totally changed the face of UK pop music culture forever. As we make our way to our site, touching down at the site, yeah, in about three minutes. Cameraman at the DJC oh. and uh, driver Chris Phillips. Let's get a pop of Let's have a, we'll have a quick look at him. Here he is in the dark. Pick any night in London in the mid 1980s and you'll find something strange going on. The rooftops were bustling with a new kind of criminal activity. And what was all this subdiffusion aid of? It was all in the name of music. So why were so many people willing to break the law just to play records? Here's a clue. Mrs. Scott has written to me from High Street, Riddings in Derbyshire, and says, I saw a picture of you recently with half your beard missing. Have you really shaved it off? No, Pauline. Have a look. That's my beard. It's still there. When Margaret Thatcher swept the power in 1979, radio was a barren wasteland. Everything was tightly scripted and officially playlisted. And if you wanted to hear black music, well, good luck with that. You had two radio stations that were commercial, which was LBC and Capital. And then you had Radio London and Radio One. Pop music was all you heard. And the odd specialist show. Well, everybody will say the same thing. If you like some music, Greg Edwards on Capital, Robbie Vincent on Radio London, that's it. The few black music shows that did exist were treated like rare treasures to be recorded and shared. We all had cassette players. We'd get our C90s and we'd go like that and we'd record, flip it over, and we'd listen to these cassettes all, all week long until, until next week's show. Stepping in to fill this black music void came a new style of pirate radio. Let me leave you with number one, Sky. Here's to you. It's been in the chart for six weeks. It was last week's number six, but it's number one. During the 1970s, there had always been a handful of pirate radio stations playing rock, punk and alternative music. But in the early 1980s, the radio landscape suddenly changed. My first music, black music on radio experience, it was Radio and Victor by chance. 
92.4. Picking it up on a Sunday afternoon. Um, by, I remember I had to get in the bath, actually get in the bath with this particular radio, and I'd pick up maybe Steve Devon or Steve Chandler. Yeah, for the past hour, it's been London's Top 20 as voted by you. My name's Steve Chandler. Have a lovely week. Music was beautiful. I used to think to myself, well, why are they not playing this on you know, commercial radio stations? Why doesn't BBC pick up on it? That's what you heard if there was a new slave record, I don't know, Just a Touch of Love, or The Jones Girls, Nights Over Egypt. When I first heard that for the first time on pirate radio, it was like unbelievable. Black music was being celebrated by these new pirate radio stations, but they were controlled by a group of suburban DJs called the Soul Mafia. This group of DJs were incredibly powerful, incredibly influential, great DJs. Chris Hill, Robbie Vincent, Pete Tong, Jeff Young. But this group of DJs, they weren't London DJs. They were all based in Essex or Sussex or Kent. In the early days of Pirate Radio, I maybe harboured um, ambitions to join one of those kind of suburban Pirate Radio stations. Hey, good afternoon, London town. This is Chris Hill on Radio Invicta. But then I quickly realised that there would be no place for somebody like me because they were all white. I never heard a, a black voice on pirate radio that I could readily connect with and identify with. Some of those DJs were a bit too professional sounding. That didn't appeal to me. Everyone sounded a bit, a bit more polished and a bit more presenter-like. And we can get that. Based outside London, the Soul Mafia existed in a world of black music, but no black people. Even in London, club culture was effectively operating under a colour bar. The landscape back then in the early 80s, it was still difficult to get a soul club, to get a place, a club in the West End or anywhere, that accepted not just black music, but black people. They wanted the black without the blackness. There's one occasion that springs to mind, my 21st birthday, very well-known jazz funk club, getting knocked back at the door and th that night was revelation time to me. I said, this is the last time anybody will ever tell me this is not your night tonight, mate. It's not your music. <laughs> and nobody will ever tell me that again. It was ridiculous, really, because, you know, inside you were listening to the best black music there was and a whole clutch of black guys trying to get in couldn't get in. They used to say, this was the catchphrase, Blacks make the music, we play it and make the money from it. You had sort of two different camps back then. There were the Soul Mafia. And then there was George Power, who done the more street dance and had a more of a black following. Cypriot-born George Power was one of the few people playing black music to a mixed crowd. No one else could do what I was doing at that time. The type of music that I was playing, it attracted the good soul people to come down and have a good boogie, show what they can do, and, uh, and the fashion as well. George's legendary club crackers brought London's black and white soul dances together even if they did have to bunk off school to get in. It was Friday lunchtime, and I used to come out of my uniform, take my jacket off, take off my shirt and tie. I'd have my T-shirt on and my school trousers. I'd have a spare T-shirt in a bag because we get sweaty. We get hot and sweaty. I see, I see brothers and sisters dancing in puddles of sweat. People who come there to dance, ex express themselves, let themselves go, and whatever you were, gay, straight, or bisexual. And it was, it was just something unique. I was one of the dancers, you know. One time, I was king of crackers. I watched Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly, and I see movies and I practice them, and then I did my little flavors. Um, and this was boogie. This was what boogie is about. And then I go to the club, and I'm ready. 
crackers or the electric ballroom, that was much more kind of urban. That was a sort of heavier London, you know. For me, it was like scarier London, blacker London. You know, it was less sort of what I was used to. But equally, it was really exciting and it was a whole other world. But it was also a world that was about to go through a period of unprecedented social upheaval and the black music pirates would be right there at the heart of it. I grew up in the 30s with an unemployed father. He didn't riot. He got on his bike and looked for work, and he kept looking till he found it. In 1981, as Britain burned and unemployment soared, a group of enterprising reggae DJs in Notting Hill got off their bikes and set up Britain's first black-run pirate station. I kept hearing about DBC, the Red Broadcasting Corporation. It was like a black radio station run by black people playing black music, and I was like, I've got to get on this station. I wanted to be part of that revolution. I knew it was important. For DBC exclusively, text to women speak. Come here. This is about changing people's views of who black people are playing this kind of music, and I had to step up. I'm not saying we just want black listeners, but there isn't a programme like that at the moment, is there? Something, you know, where it's basically for black black people. It was all done in red, gold and green. The decks were red, gold and green, the doors are red, gold and green, and so it had that vibe. It, was, it felt like a family. DBC heralded the beginning of a new force, a pirate station not just playing black music, but delivering it with the accent and attitude of London's new black music culture. Could you explain uh, how you make your living? Well, building radio transmitters for uh, unlicensed broadcasting stations. Do you mean pirate radio stations? Yeah, some people call them that, yes. The secret community of pirate radio attracted all kinds of people. Like Piers Easton, who found an outlet for his DIY engineering skills when he was just a teenager. So what actually is all of this stuff? Well, to be honest, I haven't been down here for quite a while. You know, that's, uh, that's definitely something from the 80s. That's a uh, short 80s pirate transmitter that, okay. that, that I built back then. Although it looks like the transformer caught fire on it. So where would you get something like that from? Well, I, I made that. That was made. Okay. I made that on my on my, on my sort of be bedroom table. And I could put together a, a transmitter like that for about fifty pounds, probably maybe less. And they'd be worth how much? Two hundred. Okay, so that's, not, that's not a bad business to get in as a sixteen-year-old, yeah. like making them on your mum's kitchen table. Bless her. You know, I, I owe my entire career to her. So this stuff still works. If you were to dust it off, there's no reason why yeah, you couldn't that, get you on the air now. Well, not the one that's been on fire. I think that's probably <laughs> that's popped its clogs, definitely. But uh, yeah, some of that stuff would definitely still be usable. But um, I don't get involved in that sort of thing anymore. Oh, great. No more cli climbing over rooftops for you, Dan. Yeah. As Margaret Thatcher cruised to a second victory in the 1983 election, a new parallel universe was spreading through the airwaves over London. Invisible to most, transmitted through the ether. The signs were right there in the forest of Ariel sprouting on London's rooftops. In the cat and mouse game which now unfolded, it was the enforcers from the DTI who were tasked with taking the pirates off the airwaves. The signal very, very strong and it's to our right. When you're running a pirate station, or when we were running pirate stations in the 1980s, the critical thing was not to get caught. Can we go up this road up here? We well, we've, got, we've got to go around this yeah. roundabout. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you go around the roundabout. Don't go the wrong bloody way. It's a little bit like fishing in a way. You know, you, you went out there, you didn't know what you were going to get. And uh, hopefully you kept going until you got something. We worked for the Department of Training Industry, the DTI, all the way through. It was the radio regulatory department. We, we weren't policemen, we were engineers doing an engineering job. So pirates were using their engineering skills to hide from us. We were using our engineering skills to find them. Well, we're, we're looking straight at it now, straight at it. Conservatives were in government at the time and unlicensed broadcasting wasn't something to be tolerated. I think there's a certain element of bureaucratic tidy-mindedness that we, we don't want these stations that we have no control of uh, broadcasting across the airwaves. And I think fundamentally they did not understand the demand coming from the audience. I think this must be it. Yeah, that's it. We've got him. 
there was the whole Thatcherism thing of entrepreneurial kind of get up and do it yourself. And I think DJs and promoters, they're naturally entrepreneurs. It wasn't like there was loads of jobs and stuff like that. You had to get out there and you had to do your own thing. And those that were strongest survived. And those that didn't, well, they became postmen or whatever in years to come. It's quite ironic when you think about it. You know, the Department of Trade and Industry's main remit is to promote entrepreneurialism and, you know, the expansion of, of new businesses. And there were all these pirate stations which were perfect exemplars of that in a way. You know, they were promoting music. They were young. A lot of uh, people from the black community who were overly represented in the unemployment statistics. And rather than encouraging them, they were busting them. <laughs> There was one enforcer who made it his personal mission to keep the airways pirate free. Right, superstar Loga, you're on telly, my friend. There, there were a number of people who were tracking down pirates. There was one in particular, a chap called Eric Gotts. He was, he seemed to enjoy what he was doing a little too much. He, he seemed to really take his job very, very seriously and go above and beyond the call of duty to just. To, to get pirates off the air. No, we can't right. go over there. Without argument, we can search the whole premises. So, so, Gotts, you know we always play fair with you. Well, where's yeah. the dismissing? What the what Eric Gotts was a very effective officer. He was technically very good. Um, he could be quite taciturn, but on the other hand, he had a good sense of humour. Um, but he was a good pirate radio hunter. We used to leave Christmas cards for him uh, on the transmitter, on the roof. We literally used to say, if you take this transmitter, we still love you. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And he, he kind of he liked us, I know he did. But the DTI were hampered by outdated legislation drafted in the post-war years against an imagined menace of illegal broadcasting from spies and enemies of the state, rather than people just playing reggae, soul and disco. There was a loophole in the 1949 Wireless Telegraphy Act, which was the law that the authorities relied upon, uh, that, that meant that they couldn't actually confiscate equipment. All they could do, and the, the wording was examine and test. In other words, you couldn't stop the authorities coming in and looking at your transmitter and testing it, but then they had to leave it. With the authorities powerless to stop them, the pirates seized the advantage and new stations blossomed all over London, massively increasing the exposure for the new black music they were playing. In this pre-internet, pre-download age, the secret culture of pirate radio and underground clubs was fueled by a network of specialist record shops selling American and Jamaican imports and limited edition white label releases. Yes, Mr. Romeo. Ah. How you doing, my brother? We say, Pete. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. The record shop is the source, it's the fuel, it's mm -hmm. the food, you know? So without the record shop, you don't really have any music at all, really. To, the, to you know, This is the real, this is where the essence of everything that we were about, with a pirate radio station or you're playing in the pub, you know? This and you're saying, the we're not talking about record shops like getting the top 10 hits from Woolworths. Oh, no, we're talking about specialist shops. The store owner would be a passionate person about their music as well, you know? Mm. This is like our church. This is like our um, university. Mm. It's our communication hub. Mm. This is our internet. This is our Wikipedia. By day, KISS DJ Mad Hatter Trevor worked in a record shop in Hackney. Uh, when you're around here, the majority of people who listen to Fight Rager live in areas like this. They don't, people don't live in the West End of London or around the clubs that you go to in London. They live in areas like this, so you know quicker what the majority of people are into. And a lot of people who work on pirate work in record shops as well, which does help. So you, you're much closer to the street. That's why Pirate Radio flourished, I can guarantee you, because recruitment for a lot of those stations, the hub of that would have been record stores or clubs, and definitely record stores, because you can talk, chat, and exchange information. There was probably a hundred shops in London that would have the imports and that would have the white labels. And they were critical to the movement. There'd be guys in there for four hours talking about nothing but music. And if music was your thing, that's where you wanted to hang out. The only thing missing from the record shop was a pool table. The shopkeeper would be playing all the latest pre-release tunes version after version of whatever the hot lick was at that time. It'd be a high counter, there'd be men leaning up across the counter, two, three deep, 
was literally a sea of men. And I'd have to try and move myself down between all these men to get to the front to make sure that I got these certain records as well. In those days, a lot of the tunes, a lot of the music that came, the imports that came, they only have one or two of. And if you didn't get it, it's gone. And you had to hope and pray that it came again. Sometimes I'll be thinking to myself, hmm, am I going to eat food this week or am I going to buy these imports? Food, imports, food, ah, imports one all the time. I had to have those tunes. So, yeah, the radio, the record shops, and of course the clubs, you know, that was the, the trinity. That was, you know, that was the holy trinity. <laughs> In 1985, the pirate world was shaken up by the arrival of an ambitious entrepreneur determined to take black music broadcasting to a whole new level. Interesting. OK. I spent most of my time making money from a young age. My first foray was into uh, stocks and shares. So it was all about being an entrepreneur, businessman. It was business, 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 but I loved music. An alien pirate pop station when he took it over, Zach saw huge potential in rebranding LWR as a powerhouse of 24-7 black music culture. What I inherited was a pop station. So I said about forcing some changes, basically. I said, um, from tomorrow, it's going to be a black music station. The policy is black music, simple. There's no if, buts, or maybe. If you don't like it, then you have to step off. I'm certainly going to feel the real here on LW on 92.5. A versatile selection today. Back to the dance floor. This is dance floor classic going back in time. Grown in London town. Ah, did I not see that? <laughs> I saw this as my music comes first. The best music, the greatest music's got to be played on the station. It has to be full stop. So it was just a philosophy. And I knew it works. It will work today. People buy into enjoyment, and that's what we went for. It was very visibly black. The music that we were playing was visibly black, with no apologies. Even though we were a black run and black funded, we were multicultural completely across the board. You played your own music, your own selection, and the public decided if you were any good. He saw the potential and the greatness of where black radio stations and music stations like that could go financially. So he's a lot more calculated in the decisions that he made. Zach was the only person, black guy, that I knew that drove a Porsche. He was the only black guy I knew at that time that had a mobile phone. So he was a lot more business-like. I wanted everybody who was involved in the station to be an entrepreneur. And it fed a whole industry. We felt that we were the nucleus of all which was happening musically and influencing people because everybody listened. And people listened because it was fantastic. Shit. I can't take it, I can't move. No, that's it. Done. I don't want to say anything. <laughs> Born into the brash new era of Thatcher's Britain, the pirate world was itself becoming more overtly entrepreneurial. Seeing the potential locked up in derelict no-go areas like Shoreditch and King's Cross, other young entrepreneurs began to turn abandoned buildings into makeshift venues. Factories were closing, hospitals were closing, and I just saw an opportunity to move in and do parties. You want my love and you can't deny. And I joined forces with Jules because I knew, as a black kid in London in those days, there's no way I could be putting on these parties and the police not shutting them down. The parties we did proved to be very successful. We did a lot of them. I explained to Jules that if I had a white middle-class face up front, you will see for yourself how racist the police are because they won't say anything to you. That area, we were all combat people. We were all like um, SAS. We lived that because you get Nick just walking outside your house. For some of the people I put events on with, like Soul to Soul, Jazzy B, Norma J, for them, seeing a much more mixed, kind of middle class, um, more street kid orientated vibe was, was extremely different from what they'd known up to that point. 
And there was never any trouble in those parties, and it was always mixed. Black, white, straight, gay, rich, poor. It might sound like it was sort of revolutionary, and to an extent, the warehouse scene was revolutionary in that it was the predecessor of, the, of rave culture, which um, is one of the significant youth movements of the 20th century. But actually, in my case, and I'm pretty sure in Norman's, it was hard to get the work elsewhere, so you go out and create it for yourself. In parts of Britain, you could feel the 21st century had arrived, and with it, the next century's gadgets. You could now computer control your bank account through your armchair. Stay in instant communication with office or home, the cell phone for those who never want to be alone. The 1980s was a time of high-tech revolution, and the pirate world embraced it. Given new, more powerful legislation in 1984, the DTI could now seize equipment and make arrests. But as the authorities leveled the playing field, the pirates came up with a high-tech trick to win back the advantage in an escalating arms race. Well, the microwave and other similar systems has enabled pirates to have their studios separate from their transmitters using antennas like this. Tracing down the source of these transmissions, i.e. where the studio is, is so difficult, it would actually mean a GTI engineer flying along the beam with a helicopter or, or some similar flying object. Originally, Pirate Studios had been hardwired to a rooftop rig of transmitter and aerial. Now using a microwave link, the rig could still be easily found, but the studio, connected to it by a beam, could be anywhere. The um, start of the microwave linking made our life much more difficult. But to be quite frank, uh, the quickest way of getting interference off air was to remove the transmitter, but it nearly always appeared um, fairly quickly soon afterwards. The pirate business model was designed to absorb the cost of lost transmitters, worth just a couple hundred pound a pop. Any serious station was able to switch quickly to a spare to get back on air, because the revenue they could earn from advertising was more than enough to cover the cost. I don't think the DTI ever understood this. The station only had to be on the air for a few hours to recoup more than the cost of the equipment that needed replacing. I didn't want the listener to even realise we'd been taken off. So almost as soon as one came off, another one kicked in. So <laughs> the job of the DTI was just becoming a bit too much for them. I wouldn't put us down as dummies, but they always had this ability to just keep in that odd step ahead. By 1985, the pirates were so prolific that the DTI could barely keep up with them. So the government decided it was time to make peace by giving them what they wanted, a chance to be legal. In a written answer to a question in the House of Commons today, the Home Secretary, Mr Leon Britton, said he was determined to reach practical decisions on the development of community radio as soon as possible. The Radio Authority said that it was going to give out some community radio station licences. And to go for one of those, um, you'd have to cease broadcasting. So um, Solar, Horizon, JFM and some others all came off air to be able to apply for that. Because of the Home Secretary's statement, we at Solar Radio feel that the time has now come when we should cease broadcasting as we feel our work has now been done. With the promise of legal licences in front of them, it felt like victory was within reach. Nobody really knew how it was going to look, what it was going to look like or whatever, but kind of people came off air because they kind of felt that it was uh, the right thing to do. Because at the end of the day, people don't really want to be pirates. Here in London town, Horizon Radio's final farewell day. We hope to see you again, but if we're unsuccessful, we wish you well. And we wish the people who get the licence the best for 1986. With all the main stations closing down, the airwaves were quiet. But the months dragged on with no news of any licences. We went in there full throttle. We did everything expected of us. We spent a phenomenal amount of money putting the application together. Just for PR alone, we spent £30,000. And then, without any explanation, the government pulled the plug. This afternoon's announcement by the Home Secretary, Mr Douglas Hurd, that plans for community radio are to be put on ice. It came as a major blow to nearly 300 groups, all of whom had applied for licences, and five of those licences were to be granted here in the City of London. No licences were being given, which was freakish, really, because you spent in excess of, what, maybe £70,000, £80,000 for no return, and a bit naive, too. 
we could ill afford to lose that kind of money. Some suspected that the writing that had broken out in Tottenham, Handsworth and Brixton had spooked the authorities into questioning the wisdom of giving the wrong type of people the power to communicate directly with millions of inner city youth. The Conservative Party always has two wings. It has a kind of paternalistic wing that wants to be in control of things, and it has a kind of laissez-faire free market wing. And I think there was an argument between the two of them, and I think there was a general belief, whether it was true or not, that the type of people that wanted to run these stations might not be too well disposed towards the views of the Conservative Party. The government's U-turn had backfired spectacularly. The skies over London were now wide open for a whole new generation of black music pirates to slog it out for supremacy on the FM spectrum. Zack took LWR straight back on the airways to reclaim the throne. But a new challenger was about to emerge. When the idea of KISS came about, it came about over a, a Chinese with George Powell. There's George Powell, myself, um, Tosca, uh, and they, George said to me, you fancy doing a pirate station? So I said, yeah, definitely. At that time, to be on air and run pirate radio stations, engineers were gold dust. George introduced me to his friend Tosca and Gordon Mack. I'll never forget Gordon explaining his idea of KISS FM, which was uh, a radio station that had mix, live mixing on air. And I mean, it sounds like, you know, very obvious now, but at the time it was like, wow, this is, this is something else. On that Monday, for about six or seven weeks, you know, it was I played, George Power played, Paul Anderson played, Gordon Mack played, you know, and that was really the birth of Kiss. Tosca Jackson now set out to recruit London's best underground black music DJs to Kiss FM. What about this one? Peace, Geek Valley, Catch the Beat. That, that is an original. That is an original. Ori that this is, is a pirate tune monster. I remember going to a party in a tower block. I remember hearing Mad Hat of Trevor. And he just had something, you know. He had something about the way that he played the music. The next day, I'm in the record shop working, and someone says, um, Tosca's looking for you. And I knew who Tosca was. I knew he was on Kiss, but I didn't think, I thought he just wanted some tunes. Mm -hmm. And the next day, he said, man, I was at the party, wicked last night, or whatever, whatever. Um, do you want to be on Kiss? And you know what? That line there, changed my life, mm. right? Because mm. immediately in my head, I was like, yeah. From that moment on, I became a radio person in my head. Mm. I started thinking about sh my show. Mm. I started taking my shows really seriously. I got a graveyard shift, Rodney. All right. One o'clock till four. I turned the stage. You work the hours. You, you do the what you, no, you put your graft in. No one you. was yeah. probably listening. Yeah. yeah, I'm planning my show all week, Rasta. Right. Tosca then got in touch with me and asked me if I wanted to join. And I'm like, mm, uh, and before I could say anything, well, yeah, we open tomorrow. You're on air on Thursday. Bye. Put the phone down. <laughs> before I had a chance to say no. I wanted to put Norman on the radio. The way he played music meant that it was kind of important. You know, that whole rare group thing. And what our DJs had, they had the ability of getting the best songs. You know what I mean? Really kind of understood what it meant to them emotionally. So it was really about the music and showcasing that. And I suppose that's what made it different from all of those other stations. Black music culture was now massive, but it was still restricted almost entirely to illegal radio. With the mainstream stations inexplicably blind and deaf, to the momentum working its way up from the streets, the pirates and the black music culture they represented had found their moment to shine. By 1987, with over 60 pirates fighting for space on London's crowded airwaves, stations needed increasingly powerful transmitters to be heard. And the best place for them was a triangle of South London streets in Crystal Palace known as Pirate Row. So pull up to the side. Chris Phillips, who ran K-Jazz with his friend Jez Nelson, 
and Carl Webster, who ran Starpoint, spent much of their time in the mid-80s on these rooftops. Here comes the night. The main thing about Crystal Palace is one of the highest points in London. The higher the better, the further your signal will go, the bigger your audience, all of that. So how did you actually pick a spot to stick your aerial on there? It's a matter of knocking doors. <laughs> so whoever would entertain you. Yeah, I mean, the very first aerial we got, a friend of mine who was on our station, Jez, right. his dad was getting his hair cut regularly in a barber's around here. Okay. And it got chatting about radio. My son's on the radio. And it, what came of that is, well, what, why don't they use my loft? It can pay me 25 quid a week. OK. Next thing you know, we're removing slates on top of this building and sticking 40 feet of aluminium out the top. You got buildings by luck, um, depending on where it's positioned around this triangle up here. There's one edge of the, this road here where we are now. Just uninterrupted views of London, so you've got the best reach into people's houses. Oh, great. You know what? Even this building here, just, just over here. Oh, this one here? Yeah. This corner one here. Yeah. I, I believe this is where Horizon, or one of the sort of earlier pirates from the 80s, came from. Oh, yeah. great. With so many of you around here at the time, you must have attracted a lot of attention. One Sunday, we get in a phone call, we're being raided, and came running up here yeah. to, to be met by a big crane, and they were cutting off the aerials right. as they were going down. He was sending out a signal to us to stop doing what you're doing. That building there was the home of LWR, and they were strong. I mean, they were strong in every sense. So if you're talking about building envy, that yeah. there was the spot. So LWR had the prime yeah. location. Yeah, they had the spot. The pirates were now spearheading a powerful new youth culture spreading across Britain's inner city. Their growing audiences brought in bigger ad revenue. And as with any other commercial medium, competition for market share was fierce. Of course we were the best. Of course. <sighs> they just weren't as good as us. No disrespect to them, they just weren't as good as they weren't as organised. Kiss to me was fantastic because you could turn it on and everybody who didn't get a chance to go on LWR, they could go and kiss. We're all about the music. We didn't have a load of nutters on our station, so we were easy picking. So we were always targeted, not only by the authorities, but by other stations. Get those trendy boys off the air. <laughs> I wanted to compete against Capital. I didn't see myself as rivaling any pirate. I wasn't interested, not in the least. You know, when we came on, there was an unwritten rule. There was a, a, a pirate's code, as it were, where you didn't touch each other's frequency, you didn't touch each other's block that you was on. But those, like, three years totally changed. It had become a, a free-for-all. You had a fight on your hands. The cutting of our uh, kayaks, which is basically what leads from the transmitter to the aerial, that's been cut on a number of occasions. The mains has been cut. Our rigs have gone missing. That is the transmitter. So we suffered a lot. After we realised that we were getting hit so much by fellow unlicensed operators, we decided, you know what, the best course of action, let's have our own security. I had people up on the rooftop guarding our transmitter with baseball bats. I used to guard the, the, the rigs. I used to guard the transmitter and um, the aerials. I used to be up there with my baseball bat. Never me and sometimes Gordon Mack. It was always the same people. It was either LWR or DTI. Show me one person from LWR who ever carried a bat or any kind of weapon. It didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. We didn't need to. There wasn't really a divide. It would be like if you supported Tottenham <laughs> and somebody else supported the Gooners, you know? That, that, that's the difference. You, you, almost the same neighbourhood. Um, the same, we were all singing the same hymns. Uh, would you mind staying here? Pirates don't, taking don't other pirates off the air was good news for the government, who needed all the help they could get to clear the airwaves. As the DTI struggled to turn back the tide, they now added a psychological weapon to their arsenal. They'd have it in the press that DTI state that if they capture any pirates, they'll, they'll charge them, they may get even a sentence or something, but most of all, they'll confiscate all equipment and I didn't care about any of that. Your music, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You mean that rare groove Ruben Wilson album that I'm actually bringing in, that, that I can only get one copy of? They're not taking that. 
we could seize them if we considered that they had at some time been part of the radio station. Then it was up to the magistrate as to whether he chose to give us custody of them or whether they went back. They're irreplaceable. It's not, you can't just download them like you can today again. Oh, well, no. These, they're, they're priceless. So a lot of the stuff that we seized was um, resold and the money went back into the government to offset, slightly offset, the cost of us going out there. Um, but of course, with American records, the only people that really want those sort of records are the pirates. So really, you would be putting them back into the system again. So we didn't. We, we, we actually crushed them. Yeah, they ground them up. <laughs> yeah. That, I was shit scared of that happening. And I probably was so mad about music in them days. If someone did burst in, no one's ever seen me fight, I'd probably fight for my albums. I probably would, I'd, say, I'd take some licks to try and save my albums, I'm telling you. But it was gonna take more than the threat of confiscating records to halt the pirates. In March 1987, The Sun reported that LWR had one and a half million listeners. Later that year, in an audience poll in the London Evening Standard, KISS came in at number two, ahead of Radio One. The DTI came under mounting pressure to strike a fatal blow against the illegal upstarts. The legitimate broadcasters, of course, were somewhat concerned that they paid their uh, performing rights and their rent and their rates, and uh, these guys were coming along, sticking the transmitter on top of a tower block and uh, taking some of their advertising revenues away. But the pirates were now so popular, a serious escalation was needed. In 1987, the DTI launched a negative PR offensive in a desperate attempt to sway public opinion. John Butcher, the junior industry minister, says pirate radio operators have been beating up his inspectors. He wants the public to help bring the villains to justice. One investigator operating in Birmingham died of a heart attack as a result of an incident when he was dragged from his car, stripped and beaten unconscious. The government even tried to associate the pirates with an anarchist booklet called Radio Is My Bomb. One way to hit back, it says, is to trap them in the lifts and throw the main power switches. Then take your gear down the stairs while beating up any inspectors or policemen you meet on the way. The propaganda that the government and press and the DTI and everyone else put out against the pirates, it had to kind of try and hit home with the general public to try and make them outlaws. They said that the emergency services were being kind of um, interfered with, aeroplanes were being interfered with, gas balls was being interfered with. We did have the odd complaint about um, instrument landing system problems and pilot communication problems. Why would we, sensible people, well-adjusted people, want to affect ambulances, fire or police? What is the sense of that? We were broadcast engineers, we were, we were making broadcast transmitters, we knew what a filter was, and we would talk sometimes to the DTI, and the DTI would actually say to us, well, we're not too worried about your transmitters because they don't cause interference. Now, they would never have admitted that in public, but in conversations that were had, we knew that to be the case. You talk about pirates, you know, they got to be people who are criminal-minded, who are stealing. We weren't doing any of that. It was great propaganda to try and turn people against the pirates because they'd lost the battle with the pirates. KISS now decided to run their own propaganda campaign and started lobbying to become legit. Gordon said, look, Lindsay, you've got a posh voice. Will you call up the radio authority and sort of find out how this works? So I spoke to this woman on the end of the phone called Sheila Porritt. Certainly I, and I'm sure others, got phoned up by pirates. You didn't ask precisely who they were, and they never said precisely who they were. It's a bit like the, you know, I've got a friend who really fancies you. You know jolly well it's the person in question <laughs> who is asking the questions. You know, I was like, hi, um, I, I'm, 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 I'm an interested party. Um, you know, hypothetically, um, 
if, say, an illegal radio station wanted to apply for a licence, how would they go about it? If you want um, people to go legit, and they're enthusiastic to do that, it's only wise to give them the sort of advice that might um, help them to put in a successful application. In 1988, the government finally bowed to the inevitable and announced they would award a number of commercial radio licences to independent operators. The government put out an olive branch to everybody and said, you know, we're going to give someone a licence. If you all come off and apply, we're going to give somebody a licence. But the requirement to stop broadcasting before applying smelt like a trap. It was only two years since the stations had been conned as they saw it into going off air, only for the government to pull the rug away. Would any pirate trust them not to try the same trick again? When they said that licenses were up, I was a little bit skeptical, me personally. I suppose we wanted to believe them. Um, and the, the thing was that if we didn't go for that, then was we going to be a pirate for the rest of our life? Did I really want to be a pirate radio station for the rest of my life? No, I didn't. I'll never forget the meeting that we had at KISS when Gordon dropped that one on us. You know, some guys don't want to, don't want to, they're falling for this bullshit. Are you mad? They, they, they just want us off air. You know, I voted against going off air. I wanted to stay on regardless because I simply didn't trust the authorities. We'd done all this propaganda about what wanting to be a kind of a legal station and it would, it would seem ridiculous if we didn't go for it when they then offered it. So you're definitely not going to transmit even though you may not win a licence? No. I won't, anyway. The other DJs, the other 30 DJs, that's up to them, but me personally, no. London's airwaves were quiet once again, as the pirates did voluntarily what the government hadn't been able to do by force, and came off air in the hope of becoming legal. The world of pop culture had changed beyond all recognition from the grey monotony of the era that the black music pirates had been born into less than a decade earlier. It was now obvious to everyone, except the legal radio stations, that black music culture was no longer underground culture. Kiss DJ Jazzy B had already hung up his pirate headphones and was now making international hits with his sound system, Soul to Soul. Acid House was bringing the nation's youth out of dull high street clubs in their tens of thousands as they discovered the strange new world of illegal drug fueled raves. With huge changes reverberating through the wider world, it was clear that legal radio, now ridiculously behind the times, was due for a serious reboot. The culture was now so big, it was unstoppable. We do 1989 off air, and they're about to announce the license. And it's kind of, ooh, you know, this, this is it, this is it, this is it. Well, I think the reason why there should be a jazz radio station serving London is because, firstly, all major cities have jazz radio. It was, it, I mean, uh, we were, we were inc I mean, incredulous. I mean, really incredulous. We came off air. Then it turned out that DTI fucked us over. I'm like, see what I mean? Oh, Jazz FM got it. Told ya. Yeah, yeah. Let's just get back on air. Let's just Sodom, finger, all this stuff. It felt like a bit of an establishment stitch up because they were extremely well backed by people with a lot of clout. We all thought it's a bunch of MPs who like jazz music gave it a tick off because they don't understand dance music. So, you know, let's have some jazz. Let's have some Coltrane and Miles Davis. That's what we need, that's what London needs. Feeling betrayed once again, many of the pirates, including LWR, went back to broadcasting illegally. We kind of knew that we wouldn't be given the license. Um, and I think at that time, I don't think we were ready. The country was not ready for that to happen. Um, 
or maybe they just didn't think that we were the ones that they wanted to run that kind of network. But Kiss held out. The radio authority said, don't go back on air. Just do not go back on air. There's been so many great applications that we're going to talk to the powers that be and see if we can get some more licenses. Gordon Mack now managed to attract heavyweight backing for Kiss FM's application. They got involved with EMAP, the publishing company, to give them the reputational advantage over groups of people applying for licenses where the radio division of the Broadcasting Authority at the time didn't know who anyone was. With EMAP, they knew who they were dealing with. And by this time, Virgin, um, who had lost out in the first round, they came to us and they said, look, we think that your application is really strong. We'd like to get involved with it. So they came in as an extra investor. Zach was also approached by a range of corporate investors who now saw that buying a piece of the pirate pie made sound business sense. Uh, we were approached by the media moguls who needed a front to get the license. But the funny thing is, the percentage, they wanted a huge percentage. We never went with any media moguls. We stood alone. I throw this switch. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume. Pump that bass. The 1980s played out with epic events, ending a decade when everything had changed. For most, it had been a time of entrepreneurialism and excess. But for millions of fans, it was an era when black music finally kicked down the doors to make its many voices heard. And we put the application in, and in the December, we found out we'd won the licence. Throughout 1990, KISS prepared to come on air with the hopes of the whole pirate radio community on their shoulders. This is Gordon Mack. There are no words to express the way I feel at this moment, so with your permission, I'd just like to get something out of my system altogether. We on air! Welcome, London. I was elated initially. I phoned up Gordon Mack and said, congratulations, fantastic, great. Um, I hope you do right with this license because we've all fought very hard. Can you believe it? I haven't got a lot to say right now. It's so good, we've just got to take it in what's happening around us. 100 FM, back legally. The original sound of Young London. 1990 felt like a huge victory for the Pirates, who had stuck to their guns for so long. We're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years. And we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. Margaret Thatcher, whose government had spent over a decade trying to shut the pirates down, was ousted from power just two months after KISS 100 came on air. But the dream of legalisation came at a high price. This was KISS. This is London. Multicultural London. And we gave them a radio station that reflected that. It's fantastic. But even then, you know, it was the beginning of the end, or the end of the beginning. In order to achieve their vision, the pirates had to sacrifice the very thing that made them chase it in the first place, the love of music above all else. You notice the real changes. It became more and more a business um, rather than about the music. The thing about this huge media company is they were a home county's business with home county's values. You know, we were... We were from Brixton or Tottenham or Peckham or Harlesden. You know, we were, we were pirates. So it was a marriage of convenience, but it was a very uncomfortable marriage. We know that 52% of 15 to 24-year-olds and 41% of 25 to 34-year-olds like to listen to soul in a recent survey. We're music nutters. They were business people. The business was making money. It wasn't making enough money for them. So they moved it away from a cool left-field position 
into a much more mainstream position. There was a corrosive effect, a lot of subtle pressure to conform. And so things like playlists and drive time shows and breakfast shows and all that. I don't think pirates were meant to be legal, if you want the truth. I don't think, I honestly, part of me thinks, and this is a weird thing to say, that Kiss FM died in the 80s and we could, should have been called something else in the 90s. Many thanks to David Rolligan there for the lunchtime boogaloo 11 till 2. Join him tomorrow. You're with me, Trevor Madhad, until 4 o'clock on the sound of Young London. It was a complete sellout. We want something fresh now. We don't want Radio 1 anymore. We don't want Capitol anymore. We want Kiss, the sound of the street. I think it's really hard for a station like KISS or any station to maintain an edge. And there came a time where eventually it started not quite being in the know as it might have done in the past. Too many DJs were just a little bit living in the past too much and they weren't staying up with the music. So eventually the people were going, well actually KISS isn't really representing the street. We were fighting the difference between being cool and underground and commercial and reaching a bigger audience, which left the gaping hole for other pirate radio stations to still exist. There's always been that demand for that illegal station that is on the cutting edge of bringing you what is happening right now. Just when you think that, that they've stopped it, a new, a new wave of them come out. In 1990, a new act made pirate broadcasting a criminal offence, carrying a two-year prison sentence and unlimited fines. Unlike the earlier pirates who had at least aspired to legality, it drove the new generation firmly outside the law. I think we saw, after 1990, a proliferation of a smaller stations but larger numbers. The system was, they had a computer that says uh, there's no space on the FM dial. And it'd be like, well, funny that. You say there's no space on the dial, but there's 100 pirates that are constantly on. So to say that there's no space, it's like your computer might be saying one thing, but like reality is this is happening. It's not going away. Without pirates, there could be no jungle, like to the level that it's at. There could be no grime to the level that it's at because people forever want to break, break the mold and break the cycle. I am in the building till one o'clock. When you say pirate, what you mean is our culture. That's what it is. I represent this culture of uh, creative freedom that should be shown to the world. Whether today's pirates really will be the last pirates, only time will tell. But one thing no one can dispute is that the 80s pirates changed the soundtrack of Britain in ways that are still being felt, even now. I think fundamentally, Pirate Radio in the 80s demonstrated that you could make radio, good radio, cost-effectively, and that the world wouldn't come crashing down if you let ordinary people onto the airwaves. It kind of evolved the mainstream, both mainstream media and the BBC, into a position where they didn't see sort of having a regional accent, talking a bit street, and playing underground music as being a threat. You can't do without pirates now. So it's not like, well, it came in and it petered out. It came and it's, there's more pirates today than there were back then. Norman Jay, a DJ that did loads of illegal parties. Jazzy B, a dreadlock reggae sound system guy who played soul and hip hop and all the rest of it. And little me who used to work in a shoe shop. Jazzy B's an OBE, I'm an MBE, Norman Jay's an MBE. That's mad. It's a reflection on how important that era was, how important pirate radio was, because it birthed us all in a way, you know? It gave us all a platform to do what we did. Oh my god, we even sent out a request to the BTI, but we all got jobs to do.